To begin part of our prayer time this morning, Lee is going to come and he's going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. this in just a few weeks. So all the rest of my Sunday school class, get busy. Now let's also pray for a few more people and a few more things. Father, uh, we thank you for the good report we got uh, about Sister Beverly. We praise God for that. We pray for Brother Rick, Lord. We know that uh, he's been dealing with that infection in his body, Lord. We pray that that thing will be completely wiped out and removed. We pray for Brother Jeff, Lord. We ask you to touch him and heal him, Lord. We pray for Brother Jimmy, Lord, who's getting some better, but Lord, we just ask you to completely restore and heal him. We pray for uh, Linda and Lynn, Lord, that you touch both of them. We pray for Sister Debbie, that you'd continue to touch her body, Lord, and make her strong. We pray, Lord Jesus, for Thomas, Lord, uh, thank God for him and his life. We just ask you to touch him, Lord. Whatever he is in need of today, that you would meet his need today. Father God, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for always being there for us, Lord. We ask you that you touch and heal everyone that is hurting, everyone that is suffering in any way today, that you'd lift them up, strengthen them, Bless them and deliver them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. We want to welcome everybody that's uh, joining us, whether you're here in the building. Thank you for coming. Or if you're watching us online, we thank God for you. We pray that uh, today the Lord will meet your need and bless you in whatever way you need to be blessed. We ask you that if you're going to give an offering here this morning, that you just maybe put it in that plate over there. Uh, if you're going to send it to us, you can send it by Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, or even Zelle. There's lots of different ways you can get us your offering. Or you can mail it to the church at 112 Jacqueline Terrace, Northwest, Milledgeville, Georgia, 31061. Don't forget the Northwest. That's got to be on there. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with us to Matthew, the 28th chapter. And Sister Crystal is going to read 19 and 20. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. We have a different word in the year 2024 for what a disciple is that goes into all the world. In the scriptures and in that time, I don't think that anybody thought of themselves and said, you know, I'm a disciple of Jesus and therefore I'm going to go into all the world and I'm going to teach. I don't think people thought of that. But I do believe that what happened is that they went out and lived their lives and in their interaction with other people, in their conversations, in their way of conducting their lives, they taught the things about God and therefore they made disciples. Today we have a different word for it. It's called influencers. Today, people try to influence you and me to do all kinds of things. See this brand new pen I got on Amazon? <laughs> the link is in the bio. <laughs> They're trying to influence us. Trying to influence us either to buy the product or to change the way we think about whatever it is or to learn some new information. They want to teach us what it is that they know, and what it is that they have to share. We may not think of them as having much influence on us, but they do. People that either are on Instagram or TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, are worrying about or concerned about getting enough subscribers or enough followers. Because the more followers they get, the more influence they think they have. Unfortunately, there's a negative part to that too. And the negative part is, is that you can be influenced to do the wrong thing. You can be influenced to think the wrong way. You can be influenced to change the values that you have or the values you were taught, the values your parents, your grandparents, and those before you tried to pass on to you. You can actually be influenced to reevaluate them and to look at them. I watched a video the other night where this person said, as I was deconstructing the church, I'm hoping that, uh, probably against hope, but I'm hoping that as they were deconstructing the church, they found out that the church was important and that they will actually come back to the church instead of being deconstructed from it. But the influencers are out there. Jesus said to go into all the world and teach them. Teach them to observe those things that I've commanded you. Traditional values have <coughs> fallen by the wayside. <coughs> When I was a child, or when I was growing up, or the previous generation when I was growing up, motherhood was valued. It was honored. I read the life story of a sister the other day who spent her entire life with one goal in mind, one focus in mind, and that was to create a national holiday to honor mothers which became Mother's Day. Today, people would rather 
find other things to do than be a mother. They'd rather find other things to do than take care of their family. Yet the scripture says that those who nurture the home are part of the kingdom of God. And we should value that. Most all of us, the first person, and I, I say most all of us, that, that's pretty wide of a statement. Let me, let me back up and say it this way. A percentage of us have been influenced to worship God by our mothers or our grandmothers. The first person that ever taught us to pray. The first person that ever taught us about the story of Jesus. The first person that wanted us to know how much God loved us was most likely our mother, or possibly our grandmother. That's a very important value. And yet we have an entire society today that questions whether there even is a God. I'm not too sure there is a God. But all throughout the scriptures, and even in Jesus, he said, in Mark, the 12th chapter, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That was the value of Jesus. And he taught us to go and teach others to do that also, to love the Lord thy God. Not to question, not to deconstruct, not to be influenced by the things that are going on around us, not to let the foundations of our faith be chipped away by speculation and human reasoning. That's the world we live in. One of the reasons that God wanted them to love the Lord thy God was because they lived among pagan people. They lived among people that were focused upon everything but God. And so God said, make me number one in your life. Don't let anything else influence you over me. And today, the most important thing that you and I have is this book right here. Many have died throughout history so that we might have it in our own language, so that we might read it, so that we might understand it, and so that we might be influenced by it. And yet so often the common statement is, I don't understand the Bible. I can't understand. As if that's an excuse to not read it. When I first met Debbie, Debbie didn't come from a home where God was not involved, but she, but God was not number one. God was kind of a, a part of the pie, so she had God in her life, but just a little slice of him. Later, she was led to a deeper walk with God, and she actually began to read her Bible. She had a Bible in her home. Her family had a Bible in the home, but they never really read it. They never sat around the table and talked about it. It wasn't that big of an influence in their life. But when I met Debbie, Debbie was reading the Word of God. And I remember in my ignorance, how many knows that when you're young, you don't know everything? In my ignorance, I thought that the only Bible you should read was the King James. Now at 72, I understand that any Bible is better than no Bible. You know what Bible Debbie was reading when I met her? Good news for modern man. The worst translation there is. It was horrible. I can find all kinds of problems in it. 
But I came to understand that it's not the letter of the law, but the spirit of it. Do you know that the good news for modern man has the spirit of God in it? And if somebody will read it, it will actually grab a hold of their heart and change their way of thinking about things. It did it for Debbie. <laughs> and it'll do it for you. The temptation when God is not number one, when God is not loved above all other things, is to have our attention on houses, cars, clothes, jewelry, our own appearances, our entertainment, pursuit of wealth, pursuit of power, pursuit of fame, pleasure, devotion to your job, your hobby, your country, your ideology, your heroes, your leaders, over the devotion to God. Listen, God's not against us having devotion to our countries, but he's against us having any devotion to anything other than him first. He needs to be number one in our lives. He needs to be the one that controls, the one that influences, the one that speaks to us about all the things of life that matter and make a difference. I'm so thankful that I had the values of scripture and the values of God dug deep into me because as I became a young man, I, I was tempted and I was tested by the things of the world that tried to draw me away and for a time there I did go after other things. Let me tell you, 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 you probably won't get this because it's not so much a thing anymore, but when I was a kid or a young man, it was important to have two things. You had to have a, a neat looking car and a neat looking girl. If you had those two things, man, you drove around in your car with your head high and you thought you were special. And for those people that maybe had a strip to drive, you know, in Savannah, our strip was on Victory Drive. I drove on Victory Drive probably over 500 times during that time period in my life because we would go to to Crystal's and we drive through Crystal's parking lot looking for somebody else to show off our car and our girl to. And then we get back out onto Victor Drive and speed down to Kmart's parking lot about two miles down the road, make a big turn and do it again. But I never understood that all the palm trees that were planted there along that road which I drove by hundreds and hundreds of times. Each one of them rep represented a soldier who died in World War II from Savannah, Georgia. That's why it was called Victory Drive. But I didn't know that because I was into cars and girls. And remember, those things are not bad. But when they become more important to us than God, then they tend to lead us away from our values and away from the things that are important and the ways that will sustain us in life. You know, I came to realize that cars are simply things that will eventually go to the junkyard. <laughs> and that it really don't matter what kind of car you drive. It's not that important. But what would stand the test of time was God. He would stand the test of time and he would carry me all the way through. So I thank God for my parents who taught me that early. I don't say it to brag, but it is a fact. And some, 
so in some ways, I look back on it and say, wow, what a, what a weird family I had. Because you see, my dad was an evangelist. When I was four years old, we were in Florida, going from church to church to church, preaching revivals, living in a school bus. Hey, we had a mini home before anyone ever heard of a mini home. There's a picture of it somewhere showing my dad standing at the door and my mom uh, on the ground in front of the door and uh, my sister and me beside them in front of that old bus that we lived in and traveled from town to town. And for the first 13 years of my life, maybe even 14 to, if you stretch it, I never missed a day in church. I was in church every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I didn't wonder, well, what are we going to do today? Hmm, I wonder what we're gonna what we're gonna do today. We're going to church. When my dad pulled into Sacramento, California, I was probably eight. Because my brother was born when I was nine and he was born in California. So I was somewhere between seven or eight. And the church that my dad was gonna preach at, they had decided that they weren't gonna have him. They just didn't want him. And you know, when you have a schedule and somebody says, We're, we, don't, we don't need you, that kind of messes everything up. So my dad came back to the bus and he began to pray on the front bench up there, asking God what to do. And God told him to drive. So he drove around for a few minutes and he saw a church and he pulled into the parking lot. And like this one, the pastor lived behind the church. You know, that's rare anymore. So my dad got out and he walked up and he knocked on the door. And he said, I'd like to preach. I don't have any place to preach tonight. And I'd like to preach here. The man said, my church is not really doing that well. And I'm sure we're not going to have anybody come out on a Monday night. So I don't, I don't really think I can do that. My dad said, how about if I give you $5? And the man said, what? He said, I'll pay you $5 to preach. And he said, and everything I take up in the offering is mine. The guy said, well, I don't expect nobody to come anyway. Can't hurt me. Sure, we'll do it. We were there six weeks. Six weeks, and every night the crowd was bigger and bigger and bigger. Because you see, like what my dad did is my dad went out, and knocked on doors. He went to businesses and had little things that him and my mother had written out by hand, said, come to church tonight at 7.30. God will meet your need. We would... When my dad was getting ready to go to the next revival down the road, after six weeks, that man said, please don't leave. <laughs> please don't leave. You've changed our church by the power of God. Don't leave. We, we want you a couple more weeks. <laughs> That's unheard of today. There, there are no revivals like that anymore. If you have a revival today, it might be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday if you're lucky. So I was taught to, to love God, to put him first. The second thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. Years ago, I would mow this grass, and then as my children got bigger, they would help me mow the grass. And if you talk to them, they'll tell you how much I stood over them with a whip and made them mow the grass. I prayed for years that God would give me a ride in the lawnmower. And someday, one day, we, we were able to get one.
one of the things I promise God is that you give me a ride in lawnmower and I'll mow any, anyone's lawn in this area that I can. You know, I've actually pulled up in somebody's yard right here on this street and said, can I mow your grass? And they said, nah, it's okay. Okay, no problem. But there have been a few people that have been grateful that I mowed the grass. I remember Sister Quinn coming out on her porch one day before she died and just sitting there. And I mowed her grass and then I pulled over. I said, you having a good day? She said, yes, and it's even better now that I smell the grass. I love cut grass and the way it smells. When it says to love your neighbor as yourself, I remember pulling up in one lady's yard. I, I never really knew who her name was. She never did tell me her name and I didn't ask. I didn't want to ever be a, a bother to anybody. I just wanted to help them out when their grass was you know, so high they couldn't walk in it. I just wanted to mow it down for them. And I mowed this one lady's yard here in this area. She's not here anymore, but I mowed it and uh, she came out, got in her car, waved at me, <laughs> and drove away. I wasn't expecting her to do anything, but I was grateful that she acknowledged me. I won't tell you who this is, but there's another guy in this neighborhood that never would speak to me. He would ignore me. If I'd wave at him, he'd turn his head. And one day, we went through a situation in, in Milledgeville where we had no water. They told us to boil our water and, you know, go get you some bottled water. And I don't know if y'all remember some of those times, but you'd go to Walmart and you can't find any water. Well, I had heard before that it was going to happen. I had heard kind of had a few friends call me and said, Terry, they're getting ready to put out the water thing, so, you know, draw some water in your bathtub. I jumped in the car and went and filled my car up with water, as much as I could get. And I went down this street, and every single person that would answer their door, I gave them a case of water. Well, I gave that man a case of water that day. He was standing in his yard, and I walked over, and I said, here. He said, why? I said, because we don't have any water right now. Oh, thank you. You know, he, he, he won't let me drive by him now without waving at me. Hey, whoa, hey, stop, say hello. <laughs> and the other day, I saw him with a rake working on somebody's fence, trying to get the weeds off of it. He's starting to love his neighbors too now, see. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I remember the first Sunday school class where I was taught that. And I thought to myself, this is the golden rule. And I was just a little child, but I remember gold. I like gold. <laughs> and this is the golden rule? Hmm. I got to live by that. Be kind to people. Standing in one of the stores one day and the lady in front of me, I think it was in Aldi's, and the lady in, you know how Aldi's they try to rush you through there, you know. I, <clears throat> sometimes I'm going, wait a minute, where did my groceries go, you know. <laughs> but the lady that was in front of me, when she got to the front, all of her groceries, you know, they were running them through. She said, I left my wallet outside. She looked at me and she said, I'm so sorry. Y'all don't mind waiting on me for a minute? Nah. Go ahead. While she went to the car, I paid for her groceries. <laughs> Love your neighbor. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. I turned to the person behind me and I said, I'll pay for yours too. And they said, no, that's okay. Isn't that amazing that somebody would turn you down when you want to pay for their groceries? <laughs>
the third and final value that Jesus wants us to teach others and live and have is to be humble. Never think of yourself as being somebody special or more important or above anyone else. Don't boast. Don't be arrogant. Don't be vain. When I was in prison teaching those men, and let me tell you something, it was, it was a joy to teach those men. For the most part, they were grateful that I was there. And a lot of them would run up to me as soon as the service was over and they would say, thank you for coming. Thank you for giving us this word today. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for preaching to us, teaching us, whatever. And I would always say, thank God that he gave me the ability to do it. Thank God that he brought me here. Thank God that he's always been good to me. And thank God that I'm able to come to prison. It was a sad day when I couldn't go anymore. Not the way that I did anyway. 17 years, every Monday night, you could find me at Rivers. Every single Monday night. Mark came down here from South Carolina one time, called us up and said, Terry, I want to meet you at one of the restaurants there. I said, okay. We went, and Debbie met Mark and he told her about this man came every Monday night for 10 years to teach me. And I just wanted to come and thank y'all, thank him. And I always said, you know what, brother, don't thank me. Thank God. I'm nothing. You're nothing without God. Everything you ever do, you better give glory to God because it's not you. It's the Lord. He's the one that does the work in you. You have to just be the willing vessel. My first argument with my wife's husband, uh, uh, father, excuse me, not husband, my wife's father, was when he asked me, why was I a preacher? He said, why are you a preacher? I said, because God called me when I was five years old. He said, I still don't understand it. So I turned with him to the book of Isaiah. I don't know if this is probably the first time my father-in-law had ever read the Bible. <laughs> but I turned with him to the book of Isaiah. And I showed him where God said, there's no one who will go from me. No one who will go and tell others how much I care and love them. No one will do this for me. This is God talking. And Isaiah said, I will. I will go. I said, Frank, that's what happened to me. God said, will you go for me? And I said, yes, I will. Now, I was five years old. Do you know when I finally said, I'll go? Not when I was five years old, even though I acknowledged it at five years old. I never, ever talked about it again. It wasn't until I was 21 when I went to my dad and said, I'm ready now. I've already done all those other things and now I want to do what God asked me to do. And my dad looked at me and said, wow, you finally come to your senses. That sister right over there would be a preacher right now if some man hadn't told her she, sh she shouldn't be a preacher because she's a lady. Let me tell you, she's already a preacher. She's already preaching to me, ministering to me, ministering to others, ministering to her family. God will use you if you let him. No man can stop you. But always be humble and realize that whatever you do, you do it in the power of God, not in your own power. You do it through the grace of God, not through any other thing, but through God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for giving us, Lord, values. We thank you for influencing us, Lord, to follow you. May we follow you, Lord, with our whole hearts. May we teach others to follow you also, Lord. May we demonstrate that you are number one. May we be kind to all that we meet. And when we are acknowledging, Lord, that the things that have happened in our lives didn't happen because we were strong, they happened because God was strong in us. Make these things real to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. If you don't know Jesus, I encourage you to receive him today. All you have to do is tell him you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to wash you white as snow. Ask him to take away the stain of sin and to heal you, and he will. We're going to take communion because we remember the Lord. We remember the cost of our sins. We remember the suffering of our Savior. We remember. This do in remembrance of me. We remember. And we will never forget. Father, we ask you to bless the bread and the drink. That it might be nourishment to our spiritual bodies and that it might be health to our physical bodies, and that our souls would be healed, and that we would be at peace with our God. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of sins. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you gave yourself for us. We receive your love today in Jesus' holy name. Eat and drink in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Bless your holy name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Pray God's blessings be upon you and that he continue his grace in you around you and through you to all you meet. May peace be your blessing today. Amen.